Well, you gave me us a forty up for work. I came here for education as well. For work to earn some money. Finding jobs uh, brought us to the city. We ended up staying here for good. From the islands of the Pacific and the Marae of rural New Zealand, Polynesians were coming to town. Many of the migrant Maoris and the Pacific Islanders who had joined them in the 60s and 70s had gathered in the then dilapidated centre of Auckland, Parnell and Ponsonby, Grafton and Greylin. But for many, the jobs were in South Auckland, and soon so were their houses. Utara happened, a suburb the size of a provincial city made up almost entirely of state housing. At first there was nothing but houses for the newcomers who were to live here. When we first moved into our town, there was no shopping centre, no pubs, no nothing. This used to be our swimming pool. Uh, used to have cars in it. And I felt quite lonely actually, because I didn't know anybody around this joint. The whole place was like that really. There was no social services at all, no uh, anywhere to go. Auckland may or may not be the world's biggest Polynesian city, but when the Otara market is in full swing, it's easy to see Otara as the world's biggest Polynesian village. And it may well be the least understood place in New Zealand. The so-called problems of this young suburb have been given such intense media scrutiny that many residents became embarrassed at the name itself. Unemployment, juvenile crime, street kids, broken families, booze, poverty. Otara got such a bad reputation, Otara College changed its name to Hillary. But despite such adversity, something exciting has been happening in Otara. They've become proud of the place. When I first started teaching here, you'd say to a child, no he koe, and she or he would answer, um, no kai kohe, no tūwharu tō. They thought of themselves as belonging to the tribal hinterland. But now when you ask someone whereabouts they come from, they'll answer, ōtara, or look at you strangely for having asked. A milestone in community development was the Te Puki Utara project. The big community centre by the marketplace was conceived and largely designed by fourth formers at Hillary College. They'd reacted to some newspaper publicity which criticised young people and social problems in Otara. Uh, they weren't happy with the things that were being said in the newspapers, so they set to, to find out what they thought the real problem was. They came to the conclusion that it was a shortage of recreation facilities. And what they really wanted was one big recreation centre. At Hillary, Altada's first college, has had a unique relationship with the embryo community. When uh, Hillary College um, uh, began 16 years ago, it was really the marae uh, for the uh, local community. And uh, that relationship uh, has uh, continued uh, in all sorts of ways, so that uh, the community and the school uh, are interlocked. Okay. Me ready, okay, Then after you've had that last part. Perhaps the central idea in the school is um, the need for people in the school, both uh, students and teachers, to feel good uh, about themselves and. Uh, confident about their culture before learning here can take place. The whanau system has been a key part of Hillary's response to its multi-Polynesian community. Kia ora koutou, It's a little like the house system practiced in traditional European schools. The whanau system in this school anyway is closely parallels the family life. 
the child has left behind when she or he comes in the morning. In the past, that wasn't so. That the child arrived at a very, very different social institution. In the past, too, we were saddled with the deprivation syndrome, that the Māori child came from deprived family circumstances. Now we've learned to recognise the very real strengths of the Māori child's family life and tried to replicate those in our school organisation. That's all. So that the warmth, the closeness, the intimacy of the family the kid has left behind is present when he or she gets to school. Hillary has pioneered new approaches to teaching pupils with different cultural backgrounds, right down to running its own quite prolific printing press. The stuff produced by the professional or commercial publishers and the education department is aimed at the mainstream, if you like, of New Zealand society, and therefore they're not readable, simply as that. The language is not appropriate. They, the children can't read them. And secondly, they can't relate to them all that well because they don't reflect the kind of lives and experiences that the children in South Auckland have. Educational material from the Hillary Press is sold as far south as Gore, as far north as Rarotonga. But closer to home, Hillary continues to play a key role in the community, and the community plays a key role in the school. Did you win the double? Did you win the double? <laughs> The Otara community is most visible every Saturday morning at the marketplace. The locals jokingly call it Otara Beach. This sort of thing happens back home in Samoa when I did go back five years ago. Um, they do have this sort of thing going on uh, a market and um, this is sort of like a meeting place to them. Although they come here for shopping and, and um, for buying and selling, they get that opportunity to share where during the week it's always work. Things haven't been easy for the diverse Polynesian migrants who've populated Ultara. But now some wonder whether this is the birth of the urban multicultural tribe, the Nati Ultara. It does have a great deal to offer in the way of, uh, of uh, warmth and sharing and caring. It has a tremendous uh, vitality and energy if we can uh, develop the leadership, we'd be able to develop the community. In Otara, even the gangs play a role. The security officers at the market are stormtroopers. It's not just a gang that roams around terrorizing people and that. A lot of people come in, they meet us, and they get the true version of what we're really like, eh? We're the most together community we know, you know, around the South Auckland anyway. We're pretty close-knitty, and uh, we look after one another. That's what we're all about. Eh? Well, that's what all communities should be all about. Even though we are urban people now, we probably still retain a lot of rural traits. You still need to have association with people who are similar to you and that sort of thing. You know, the population level in Ōtara has, has always been mostly of young people. Well, you ended up, uh, you know, clinging to other young people who are interested in the same sorts of things or who are similarly underprivileged. Because they don't have the sort of political knowledge to do anything about this situation. There will always be a new group to replace them, just like this, the Yogi mob and the people that hang out down the Space Invaders and that, they'll be the new gangs. The Yogi Bears are one of the new generation of teenage gangs in Ōtara. Their interests include hanging out in the streets, playing video games, drinking beer and the burglaries they're keen to talk about. Once we run out of money, we need money. Well, that's the only thing to do. Rob the rich and feed the poor. It just happens. Okay. <coughs> Half of these shops, when you, when you walk into a shop, they think, oh, there's a little married boy going to feed. 
Let's have a look at them. I'll be back to do your shop. Yeah? We like doing them, but if we get caught, we don't like the police behaviour, as you know. No, waters, they, they don't give you hiding or any hassles. Feels more jobs around. More jobs. More jobs there. Less people do, do around the streets. There's as much bravado as burglary among the yogis. But the streets of Ultara are just about all they know. Perhaps half of them have found employment. Efforts are being made in Ultara to help disadvantaged youngsters. The Māori Affairs funded kōkiri do valuable work with kids who've ended up poorly educated, unskilled and unemployed. At the Aranui Kokori, they learn carving and other traditional skills. Coming here has meant a second chance for them to find themselves and to get confidence in themselves. Because it's something they can achieve and can see immediate results for their work, it's just instantaneous. The boys that come here, uh, nine times out of ten, have never held a chisel in their hand before. The Aranui Kokori uses traditional skills in an effort to plug kids into a system which has failed them. But just down the road at the Te Rahuitanga Kokori, they're developing more innovative community-based programs. The Kokiri has 25 acres of crops under cultivation and the main crop is kumara. The biggest kumara crop in the Auckland area is grown right here in Otara. Actually we go by the calendar, Mary calendar. That's how you tell whether they're good days for planting. The Kokiri's market garden has provided work for dozens of Otara people. Best I buy ever had because uh, there's not many jobs that you can, where you can bring your kids to work but it's also a successful commercial operation. This year, 40 or 50 tonnes of kumara have been harvested, and this is just one of the kokiri's activities. The philosophy is building on people's abilities that they have and encouraging them um, to use those abilities to become self-sufficient, um, also to build up their confidence and their self-esteem. We try and encourage as many people to come here as possible and that's both young and old. <laughs> Dan Raniera Grace grows a plot of his own at the Kokiri and he takes them home to his own Kumara pit. These days Dan's pit is probably the only one in use in Auckland. Where else but Otara? Increasingly, the people of Ultara are finding answers to social problems in their own community. But they're being helped by some remarkable people, particularly women. Donna Awateri enrages the establishment. But in Ultara, her profile is quite different. She's inspired this parenting project and trained these local people to carry messages about parenthood into the community. What I get out of the group is really helping me as a mother myself. And what I'm giving to them is helping themselves and their families. Who? Well. Donna Awateri's four-minute remedial reading program is allowing teachers and parents themselves to help many children who are failing to learn to read at school. Please get me The system has really failed our children in Ōtara. We've got children growing up who speak neither language fluently. They're bilingual non-verbals. We've got failed readers of a huge proportion. We've got children who are very depressed. We've got children who self-mutilate themselves, just razor blade their arms open. We've got more suicides from this area than in any other part of the country. But to me, the worst thing that is happening is that schools are teaching our children how to fail. They're learning that they are nothing, that they cannot succeed. They're learning to be useless and to be helpless. The exciting thing, though, that is happening is that the children and the people are rising above it. And it's something wonderful that is particular to Ōtara. 
There are other signs of a growing closeness in the pubs of the area. The public bars of South Auckland have at times been battlegrounds. Bars like this one at the East Tamaki Tavern were the sharp end of the multicultural experience. Things have changed. A few years ago, this place used to be a wild sort of a place. But now, uh, people got used to one another. So it turned out to be a good place after all. The East Tamaki Tavern is Otara's local, and the regulars here, Māori, Samoa, Rarotongan, Tongan, Nuayan, make the pub a little community of its own. It is a very different community. It is a community, nevertheless. South Auckland Polynesians come to Cockle Bay, Howick, all the time. Together, cockles. But Cockle Bay is just about the only part of affluent Howick and Pakaranga where there is a Polynesian presence. Just up the road, they play Space Invaders and they worry about where to get the change. So in South Auckland, there are remarkable contrasts. Utara, Mangari to the west. And several miles up the road, Pakaranga and Hawick. Brown and white, rich and poor. And they have very little to do with each other. Every school day in Utara, scores of children are bused to more orthodox schools outside the area. But there's been a more significant migration from Otara. In 1965, the primary school population of Otara was about 45% Polynesian. But Europeans have left. School rolls are now approaching 100% Polynesian. At the same time, Pakaranga and Hawick are almost all white. In large areas of these eastern suburbs, fewer than 1% of the population are Māori or Pacific Islander. Ralph Witten straddles the scene. He's an Otara ward councillor on the Manukau City Council, but he lives in Howick. The plain and simple facts are that the Pakehas have left Otara uh, and the schools are practically, in some cases, 100% Maori or Polynesian, and it's fair to say that there's been a form of apartheid by natural selection. One of the things that really makes me sad is that youngsters who go to our school have virtually no appreciation of what other people are like. They may see Polynesian people at Cockle Bay Beach on a Sunday afternoon, they may read about them in a newspaper, and that's the limit of their knowledge. People are entitled, I guess, to, to feel comfortable where they live, and so it uh, could be said to be natural that the Polynesians are grouping together and uh, the Pakehas likewise. But if we aren't comfortable living together, uh, it's apparent that our differences are probably abrasive and this is a pretty bad future for New Zealand. I think probably there are people who settle in Hawke and Pakaranga for the very reason that there aren't a lot of Polynesians here. I see it as a sad thing that our children can live so near such a large community of Polynesians further south um, and not benefit from the cultural differences in classroom situations and normal community living situations. I've lived in the Howard community ever since I was married 28 years ago and uh, I've got many, many friends here and they're tremendous people with so much to offer. They, 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 by education, by motivation, by parenting and everything else, they've got so much to offer. 
and they're in danger, I believe, of becoming an, an insular and rather irrelevant uh, community that, that has not contributing anything like its potential to the development of New Zealand and, and, and of Auckland as a, uh, as a uh, community. Just as Hawick and Pakaranga have developed apart from their South Auckland neighbours in Ōtara and Mangari, so too is Ōtara developing in its own way. A major education survey talks of Polynesians building their own fresh culture here. But the survey is about special needs in Ōtara and Mangari schools, and it is called Tomorrow May Be Too Late. Some believe it might well have been called Too Late. I truly believe that if something drastic isn't done about the education of our young Māori people, and Māori people in general, that we will become, within the next 20 years, second-class citizens in the country of our origin. The consciousness of people here is rising. All the best movements in New Zealand come from here. We've got the strongest black women's indigenous group in the world. I describe the situation in Ōtara as political dynamite. There's a time bomb here. And if and when it blows, you better all watch out. Already in Ōtara, there are the beginnings of a new sort of community in the city. Some of the trailblazers are Fakaho, a dedicated group of young Ōtara men and women. They grew up in Ōtara. They all went to Hillary, and they see themselves as the first elders of the Nati Ōtara. Because Ōtara was the kind of place it was, um, there, were, there weren't any sort of elders or older people that grew up with the, with the place, or if there were, they shifted away. What happened was that the elders of the place were end up being us, um, because we were there longer than anyone else, and also because older people we were still sort of yearning for the marae back at home. This group is very strongly anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-ageist, anti-capitalist. It's to make a new or a resurgence of um, people who are aware of um, their identity of their own personal needs and applying those ideals upon the community as a whole. I wish this is a very long-term goal. In our, mind, in our minds, we can cast to the future and see three generations away, perhaps, um, our utopia where hopefully you know, our descendants could live and survive within their own community circles. And then in order to get that, we have to fix changes now. We would like the community to be able to control their own lives, um, not, to, uh, not to have decisions made by them, significant decisions that affect the community, made by people who don't even live in Ōtara. Made by people who, who, you know, who don't even drive through Ōtara, perhaps. For all of their apparent radicalism, the Whakaho people are helping build a community with touchstones from their past. When Zena needs advice or support, she goes to see her komatua, her elder, Miro Stevens. Miro has lived in Ōtara for 20 years, but she came from Northland. She learned English as a second language, but she clings to her Māori language and culture. She's a link with the past, her ancestors line her living room wall.